Shower I up, please. I want you to close your eyes and commit yourself to the Lord in prayer. That the fellowship and the worship and the study of tonight will be of great, great benefit to you spiritually. That the promise of the Lord to be filled with the promised righteousness will be yours. In Jesus' name we pray. I greet God in heaven, how we thank you and worship your name for bringing us together once again. We thank you for the love and the joy, the interest of giving your people. That every time we gather together here, we are ready to receive from you. And thank you for all those who are in the Bible study locations, either in the churches or in special places that are listening and linking up together for us to study the bible together tonight we pray O oh lord as you are blessing us here you bless everyone over there in jesus name Amen. and we pray that your word will enrich every life Amen. that will be the better for the study of the word of god in jesus name Amen. bless your people tonight and use us as channels of blessings for many other people around us thank you lord because we know you have answered in Jesus name we pray Amen. Thank you very much You can be seated We're coming back to the study of the word of God And we're looking at the words of Jesus Christ At this time just like we've been doing From the beginning of this year We're back to Matthew chapter 5 In Matthew chapter 5 we're reading from verse 6 Matthew chapter 5 verse 6 Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. As you look at that word, filled, for they shall be filled. Have you noticed that the way God the Almighty has created the whole universe, He doesn't allow any place to be empty. That means in God's creation. There is no vacuum anywhere, no emptiness anywhere. The implication is this. If somebody is not filled with this material, it will be filled with this other thing. That means then, if we're not filled with righteousness, there's something else that is going to fill us, and that will be unrighteousness. Pick any man on earth, anyone on earth, in church or outside the church. You're going to find out everyone is filled. Either we're filled with righteousness or we're filled with unrighteousness. That's why the Lord is saying we shall thirst and we shall hunger at a righteousness so that we can be filled with righteousness. If you leave your heart empty, if you leave your heart without the infilling of the righteous nature of the Lord, Sooner or later, you are going to be filled with unrighteousness. Sinners, in fact, are all filled with unrighteousness. That's why the Lord is telling us, you come out of that unrighteousness. And then you come to the Lord. And as soon as you come to the Lord, He grants you salvation. He forgives your sin. He cleanses your life. He turns around your whole life. And then you do not remain there. You become filled or you become thirsty and hungry at a righteousness so that you can be filled with righteousness. What happens to the people that have no thirst at all? No hunger at all at a righteousness. What are they filled with? In Romans chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 29. Romans chapter 1, verse 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness. You see that? That's what the Lord is telling us. He's saying you cannot be neutral. You can, there is no standing on the fence. You're either on this side or you're on that other side. You're either with the people of God, the believers, the saints of God, and you're thirsty and you're hungry after righteousness and you're in the process of being filled with righteousness. Or on the other hand, there is no thirst for righteousness. There is no hunger for righteousness. There is no passion. There is no desire for righteousness. 
And you say, well, I will be neutral. I'm not on this side. I'm not on that side. There's no way to be neutral. There's no vacuum anywhere. If you're not filled with righteousness, you're going to be filled with unrighteousness. Look at that verse 29 again. Being filled with all unrighteousness. Fornication. Wickedness. Covetousness. Last cheap maliciousness full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do, do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. And there is a warning there, as well as encouragement. A warning that if you don't hurry up and get filled with righteousness, you are going to be eventually filled with unrighteousness. I told you, pick any society. Any group of people, any assembly, assembly of people, anywhere, whether at the time of Jesus or in our own time, nobody can be on a neutral ground. Nobody can say, I'm not filled with righteousness, but neither am I filled with unrighteousness. The people at the time of Jesus, after Jesus gave them this message, watch what many of them, the majority of them, in fact, what, what were they filled with? Look at Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4 and i'm reading to you from verse 28 luke chapter 4 verse 28 and they and all day in the synagogue when they heard these things were filled with wrath you are either filled with righteousness or you are filled with wrath you are either filled with love or you are filled with hatred you are either filled with holiness or you are filled with uncleanness unrighteousness in acts of the apostles chapter 5 acts chapter 5 we're reading from verse 17 acts 5 verse 17 then the high priest rose up and all they that were within which is the sect of the sadducees and were filled with indignation you are either filled with indignation or you are filled with tenderness. Either filled with anger or you are filled with humility and tender love. You see, you cannot be neutral. That's why the Lord is telling us we need to thirst and we need to hunger after righteousness so that we'll not be in the danger and the peril in the damnation of being filled with unrighteousness. We're told in Micah chapter 6. Micah chapter 6, the danger of the people who are not filled with righteousness. What are they filled with? And as you examine your own life, as you examine what fills your heart, what fills your soul, what fills your personality, then you begin to think, are you actually thirsty after righteousness? Are you hungry after righteousness? What you are filled with, what fills your heart, what fills your thought? What fills your imagination will tell on which side you are. Micah chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 12. In Micah chapter 6, verse 12, it reads, For the rich men thereof are full of violence, and inhabitants thereof have spoken lies, and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. Therefore also will I make thee sick in smiting thee, and in making thee desolate because of thy sins. Those people are full. They were full of violence. And Jesus spoke to the Pharisees and Sadducees and the scribes in Matthew chapter 23. And here is what he said concerning them. What they were filled with. These were religious people. And I told you, whether you are in synagogue or you are in church or you are in temple or you are on the street anywhere you are. There is no neutral ground. You must either be filled with righteousness or you might be filled with unrighteousness. Matthew chapter 23. In Matthew chapter 23, we're looking at verse 28. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, 
but within are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. You examine your own heart. Are you full of hypocrisy? Are you full of insincerity? These people were not just ordinary members of their synagogue. They were even leaders, religious leaders, in their religious circles. And yet, the word of God says, even though they had the privilege of meeting the Lord Jesus Christ, of hearing from the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, of testing, if they wanted to, the power of the Lord to change them and to turn them around. Yet, it says at the very end of the ministry of Christ that these ones were filled with hypocrisy and iniquity. I'm going to challenge you. You may come into the Bible study. And you are one of the people that by the grace of God say, praise the Lord. I've never missed any Bible study. Not in a few years. I always come. Except I'm sick. I'm always there. And praise the Lord. I've not been sick. No, not on Monday. I'm always there. You're always here. Have you been filled with righteousness? And with all this series we're going through, is it just going into the head? And it doesn't appear to have any function, any effect, any impact on the heart. Are you filled with hypocrisy? Who is a man that is filled with hypocrisy? Somebody whose private life is totally different from his public life. In the public he appears all right. And he appears righteous. And he appears sincere. And he appears truthful. And he appears honest. But in the private, in the recesses of the heart, or in the privacy of the home, between husband and wife, in the privacy of the office, between the office workers and the secret things they do, they are full of hypocrisy. Read that verse again. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous unto men. The public life appears okay. But the private life, the secret life, it says, but within, ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. In Proverbs chapter 26, Proverbs chapter 26, the things that fill men's hearts and men's lives. In Proverbs chapter 26, verses 9 and 10. As the sun goeth up into the hand of a drunkard, so is a parable in the mouth of fools. Then it says, The great God has found all things, both rewardeth the fool and rewardeth the transgressor. It tells us that God rewards everyone, both the fool and the transgressor. As we look at the word of God in Psalm 26. Psalm 26, I'm reading from verse 10. In whose hands is mischief, and their right hand is full of bribes. Their right hand is full of bribes. Now you see there are people that claim to be Christians. They claim to be believers. But I told you, no matter what name you call yourself, what title you give to yourself, it is when you're looking for work, or maybe you're looking for a wife, or maybe you're looking for favor, or you're looking for something. That's when we'll know whether you're full of righteousness or you're full of unrighteousness. In the case of these people, it tells us that their right hands are full of bribes. And there are many people, they come to Bible study, and they come to fellowship, and they come to say that they are worshipping. They might even say they are ministering to all the people, they are in the service of the Lord, but their hands are full of bribes. Either they are giving directly themselves, or they are like the middle man or the middle woman, the middle lady, between the one giving the bribe and the one that is getting the bribe. And their right hands are full of bribes. I about the people who are full of envy and jealousy. If other people are doing something good, something great, something commendable, it fills their heart with hatred and anger. It surprises them. Why is the praise and the glory going to do so and so? And it's not coming to me. And if anybody is doing something good, something great, their hearts are full of 
envy. If your heart is like that, you need something. You, you need the grace of God. You need the salvation of the Lord. Because it says you cannot be in isolated condition. In a neutral condition. You are either filled with righteousness or you are full of unrighteousness. Acts of the Apostles chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 45. Acts 13 verse 45. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy. When they saw that the multitudes were op open to the gospel, open to the word of God, they became filled with envy. Are you like that? You say you're a worker. And when you see other workers, they're doing something great and something commendable. And people are talking about what they're doing. And they're giving testimony as to what they're doing. Then you're full of envy and jealousy. Why isn't it me? I should be getting that glory. Why is the glory and the praise and the appreciation going to those people? Why not to me? Why not to my group? Where your heart is full of envy, then you're not full of righteousness. And you know, there are people, when you're full of envy, you're not going to keep quiet. You're not going to be there. You're not going to be silent. You're going to do something that shows that your heart is full of envy. Look at that verse, verse 45 again. And they speak against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Was it because Paul preached anything wrong? No, not at all. It's envy and jealousy. Was it because uh, Paul did not preach the whole counsel of God? No, not at all. Just because of envy and jealousy. You watch, especially if you're in the same ministry with another person. Your preacher is a preacher. Your singer, she is a singer. And then you're doing something, he's also doing it. And then he happens to do it better than you're doing it. And watch how your heart reacts to what praise and glory and honor and the fruit of the ministry of that individual. If your heart is full of envy, you're going to be speaking contrary. You're going to say, what have they done? There are a lot of mistakes in what they're doing. That's what you're going to be saying because your heart is full of envy. And then we're told, in, uh, we're told in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 13, verse 10. Acts 13, verse 10. And said, O fool of all subtlety and all mischief. Subtlety, cleverness, cunningness. And also, it says there, all mischief. You see, somebody will be mischievous if their heart is full of unrighteousness. You'll be causing trouble for other people. You will be causing, uh, you'll be making pitfalls for other people. You'll, you'll not want the people that are hearing the gospel to believe the gospel. Uh, can you imagine somebody that is standing before or uh, standing beside a leader? Standing be, uh, be, beside a captain. And that fellow wanted to receive the word of God. What will make a man to want to deny his leader to receive the blessing of God? It's because the heart is full of unrighteousness. And so we're told this man, he wanted to derail the preaching of the gospel. And he wanted to distort the preaching of the gospel. He wanted to hinder uh, the, the, the man, the deputy, from hearing the word of God. And then Paul, the apostle, looked at him and he said, you know, you have a problem. The problem is your heart is full of subtlety and mischief. I pray the Lord will help us. In Job chapter 20. Job chapter 20. Watch your heart. Watch what you are filled with. Job chapter 20. I'm reading from verse 11. Job chapter 20 verse 11. His bones are full of the sin of his youth. Which shall lie down within in the dust, full of sins. The Lord is telling us something that you cannot be neutral. I've told you over and over and over again there's no vacuum in creation, and there's no vacuum in any heart and in any life. 
If you are not full of righteousness, you'll be full of unrighteousness. If you are not full of love, you'll be full of anger and hatred. If you are not full of tenderness, you'll be full of aggressiveness and violence. If you are not full of something good, you'll be full of something evil. That's why the Lord is speaking to all pilgrims, all the people that want to get to heaven at last, and he says, there must be a change. You must be emptied out of what you have so that you can have the feeling of the righteousness of God. We come to Matthew chapter 5 and we're looking at verse 6. In Matthew chapter 5 verse 6, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled. We shall be filled today. Of course, it's possible to be spiritually filled with the fullness of God and the fullness of Christ and to be fulfilled. Otherwise, the Lord Jesus Christ would not have taught us to hunger and to thirst after what he knew was impossible. Righteousness and spiritual fullness, is not a, they are not mirage, but they are real. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ instructed us to hunger. And to thirst after righteousness so that we can be filled. We're dividing the study tonight to three parts. Number one, hindrances to the promised spiritual fullness. Hindrances to the promised spiritual fullness. Number two, hunger and thirst for the promised spiritual fullness. Hunger and thirst. For the promised spiritual fullness. Number three, the hungry and the thirsty, satisfied, filled, and fulfilled. Let's come back to number one. Number one, hindrances to the promised spiritual fullness. The fullness has been promised in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. They shall be filled. That's the promise of God. And we know that God is a faithful God. He is faithful who has promised. Why then are not some people receiving that promise? Why are they not being filled with righteousness? In number of reasons, let's look at the Bible. In Proverbs chapter 27 verse 7. Proverbs chapter 27 verse 7. The full soul loatheth and honeycomb. The full soul loatheth and honeycomb. You see, if somebody is satisfied already, filled already, and there's no space for any other in feeling, the fellow will not be able to have this righteousness filling his soul, filling his heart, filling his spirit, feeling his life, and feeling the actions of his hand. You see, if you're full already, you're satisfied with what you have. Although what you have may not take you to heaven, there are people that are full of activities. And those activities, they fill them up, they satisfy them. It's like that's all they're looking for. And once you're satisfied like that, you think there's no other thing. It's like many of our friends that we're witnessing to, we're preaching to them. And we're trying to tell them that they can be born again. They can be saved. But they happen to be ministers and officers and workers in the denomination that they go to. And they're so satisfied with activity. And they're so satisfied with religion that righteousness is not a desire for them. They don't think they want to be righteous after all. See what they have and see what they have. Or maybe they have some religious title. And that religious title is all they want. And then it says, once you're full, then you'll not desire the righteousness you ought to have. I'm going to ask you, although you are here with us in deeper life, are you so full of activities? And you think that the work you're doing, that's what will take you to heaven. And you do not remember you ought to follow peace with all men and uh, holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And it appears that just the office and just the title and just the activity and just the ministry and just whatever it is you are doing, that's all that's enough. And in fact, there are some people, if it were not for the office they are holding in the church, they will not come to the Bible study. They will not come to the worship because the thing that really interests them and what they are coming for is just this office. 
and they will do anything to keep that office. That will not take us to heaven. I've told you before, I should tell you again, preaching does not take a preacher to heaven. It's holiness and righteousness. Singing does not take a singer to heaven. It is holiness and righteousness. Walking in the church, in the work of the Lord, does not take anybody to heaven. It is the holiness and the righteousness. We need to learn that. Otherwise, we'll be so filled with the activities. And then, that will satisfy us. It's like there's no other thing to do. But righteousness is what will make us, it will, it's what will help us to be able to get there. Otherwise, we'll be so satisfied like the Laodicean Christians. In Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 17. Revelation chapter 3, verse 17. Here are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, because thou sayest, I am rich, and increase with goods, and I have need of nothing. Can you think about some people like that, it, that they say that they have need of nothing, doesn't really mean they don't have need of anything. Because they didn't really know, they didn't understand their spiritual condition. It said, the Lord Jesus said, because thou sayest, thou sayest, you know, sometimes when people come out, it's kind of uh, pathetic and funny. You know, they come out and they say, praise the Lord for me since I came to the Lord. See the great blessings in my life. I have not been sick. That's wonderful. But my brother, healing does not take us to heaven. I have not uh, been, you know, oppressed at all. Praise the Lord. But deliverance from evil spirit doesn't take us to heaven. You see, there are people that are so satisfied and they're so happy. Material blessing. They've got money. They've got job. They've got wife. They've got children. They've got healing. They've got deliverance. They've got everything made for them. And then they say, I have need of nothing. And follow them home. And see the life they live. And see the anger. And see the envy. And see the indignation. And see the lifestyle. And yet, they do not have what will take them to heaven. And they say they have need of nothing. That's why Jesus Christ said in that same chapter 3, verse 17. In the second part, it says, And you say you have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and uh, naked. And you think of a naked person going on in the street and you want to give him the robe of righteousness. He says, no, I don't need that. I'm all right the way I am. Can you think of somebody who is not rich in faith, but is it's rich in money? And then you want to give him how to have the riches of faith. And says, no, I have need of nothing. You want to, you find somebody who doesn't have salvation, doesn't have righteousness. And you want to give unto him the garment of salvation. And he says, no, I'm all right the way I am. That's what Jesus Christ is saying. You see, when we're self-satisfied, then we're self-deceived. We deceive ourselves because we think we're all right when we're not all right at all. That's why some people do not have the promised spiritual blessing. Mark chapter 4, verse 19. In Mark chapter 4, verse 19, here we read the word of God and the cares of this life. And the deceitfulness of riches. And the lust of other things entering in. Choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. Choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. Uh, would you look up here for a moment? Uh, let's say for example all the outlines of the Bible study that you have had since you started coming to this church. If you pile all those Bible study outlines together. And then let's all just assume for illustration's sake that all the grace, all the power, all the strength, all the ability, all the divine energy in all those outlines that were studied together, let's say they were transferred into your heart, into your life. By this time, you'll be a champion, a giant in faith. But why are those things not there? Why do we have it on paper? And then we listen over, maybe over maybe one hour or one and a half hours. And then the second day, everything is gone. It's evaporated because of the cares of this life. 
the cares of this life will not allow many people to pray in the word and to transfer that word from the paper to the head, from the head to the heart. And it is that transference of the word of God, the strength of God, the grace of God, and the power, the virtue of righteousness coming into our heart. That's what makes the difference. But you see, it says, because of the cares of this life, the cares of this life, you know, those of us who are in Deeper Life Bible Church, uh, other churches, uh, uh, they even appreciate the way we study the Bible, and we too we appreciate the way we study the Bible. But as we appreciate the way we study the Bible, how many hours do we have in the day? 24 hours. When you come to Monday Bible study, how much time do we spend at the Monday Bible study? I mean the real study proper. Maybe about one and a half hours. Out of 24 hours. And then the following, you know, if you think of all the days of the week, 168 hours. How many days do we really spend reading the word of God, studying the word of God, praying on the word of God, and writing the word of God on the tables of our heart? By the time you come one, two, three, four times, uh, four times one and a half, one and a half times four, that's only six hours. Out of 168 hours, how do we spend the rest of the time? Are we meditating on the word? Are we practicing the word? Are we reading the word? Are we translating the word into our lives? Is it not the cares of this life? What are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? And then our lives are so filled with those things. In fact, many, many people who are studying the Bible, they are much more serious about the cares of life, about the deceitfulness of riches, about the things of this life, more than the word of God that we're studying. You know, for example, those of us who work in a dedicated places. What I mean is that, uh, let's say you are, uh, you are doing something, you have to measure something and give it out. A little, little deviation can cause real damage into the work you are doing. Or the lives of people were very meticulous, were very careful. We measure everything and everything is into detail. Everything we do, for example, you are working in the bank. How meticulous we are and you calculate everything and you search for everything and if you have just about six naira or nine naira missing at the end of the day you stay you stay there and then you work it out you look at all your ledger all your account books and you must balance everything up that you have to do that that's right that's good but and with that meticulous in the word of god if i go back home between me and my wife if something is missing what I mean is the temper that a Christian ought to have, if that is missing, the attitude, the righteous attitude, the good attitude that I ought to have, that is missing, or the right action, righteous action, if that is missing, am I that meticulous? As the banker will be meticulous looking for that missing six naira, nine naira, nine naira is nothing, and yet he must look for it and balance his account before he goes home. Before I sleep at night, if there's anything between me and members of my family, do I meticulously find out I must be full of righteousness? I must not sleep over on righteousness. Am I that meticulous? That's what I'm saying. That you see, many people, the cares of this life and the cares of deceitfulness of riches will not allow them to be able to meditate on the word of God and say, I'm going to take the word of God as serious as I take the things of the world. That's what the Lord is telling us. And if we're not that serious, we might not be able to make it eventually. Mark chapter 4 again, verse 19. Read it with understanding. And the cares of this world. And the deceitfulness of riches. And the lust of other things. Entering in choke the world. And it becometh unfruitful. Have you seen the reason now why many people appear unfruitful? Unrighteous? Studying the world? Praying on the word, coming every time, and yet the fruit of righteousness is missing because of those things we have there. Then we're told in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 10. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 10, and it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which is swear unto thy fathers to abraham to isaac and to jacob to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not houses full of all good things which thou fields not and wells ditch which thou dig dig the not 
and vineyards and olive trees, which thou plantest not, when thou shalt have eaten and be full, then beware, lest thou forget the Lord. When we have those material things, material wealth, but they are wonderful and good. And Abraham was rich. There's no problem with riches. It's our attitude to the riches. In the case of Abraham, he possessed riches, but the riches did not possess him. You possess riches, no problem. It's when the riches possess you, and they control you, and they master you, and they ride on you. That's when you have a problem with the riches. But you see, in the case of Abraham, he had the riches. But there was no problem there. The thing did not control him. And the thing did not take the love of God and the worship of God away from him. But then, here is the warning that we have. That when those things increase... We ought to be aware, we should be very careful, lest at that time we forget God. Is it, uh, is it not the reason why some people, why they cannot find time to come to the Bible study anymore? And I think our pastors and preachers and overseers can help us in this area. What I mean is this. There are people that are not able to come to the Bible study or the revival hour on Thursday night because they go on shift duty. And uh, we prayed for them to get job. Before they got the job, they'll be here. They listen to the word of God. That time they are very spiritual. Now they've got the job. Money is coming. This one is coming. That one is coming. They cannot come now because of the ship duty. What if we made an announcement and say, if you are not there Monday night and you know you are free Tuesday morning, can you uh, show up? Let's say on Sunday. And then all those people raise up their hands. Okay, for you, your Monday, your Bible study will be Tuesday morning. That will be wonderful. So that those who have the time, they are there on Monday night. And then all these people that are missing the Bible study. And they have the danger of not being ready for the coming of the Lord. The danger of not being filled with righteousness. We make allowance for them, provision for them. And then on Tuesday morning, when they are free, instead of just sleeping at home, they'll be able to hear the word of God. But the Lord is telling us, beware. When the riches increase, when it appears that things are available, that those things will not take your heart away from the Lord, but that you'll still be serving the Lord. I pray it will, will not derail away from the Lord in Jesus' name. Luke chapter 18, verse 9. Luke chapter 18. I'm reading from verse 9. Luke chapter 18, verse 9. And he spake this parable unto certain that trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. That's the problem of many people. That's the reason they are not filled with righteousness in the real sense. They assume that they are righteous. They say they have righteousness, but the righteousness in the sight of the Lord is not, applicable, is not acceptable. And it will not take them to heaven. It says that these people trusted in themselves that they were righteous. They were not trusting the Lord. They were not trusting the power of the cleansing blood of Christ. They were not trusting the efficacy of the power of the Lord to cleanse us, to wash us, to make us clean, to make us righteous. They were trusting in themselves that they were righteous. Who are these people? Look at Proverbs chapter 30 verse 12. Proverbs chapter 30. And I'm reading to you from verse 12. Trusting in themselves that they were righteous and they despised others. In Proverbs chapter 30, verse 12, there is a generation that are pure in their own eyes, not in the eyes of God. Pure in their own eyes and yet are not washed from their filthiness. They are not washed from their filthiness. Now, in Daniel chapter 12, Daniel chapter 12, I'm reading to you from verse 3 and verse 4. Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Verse 4. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words 
and seal the book. Even to the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Knowledge shall be increased. How does that pose a problem to us? Great, great problem. You see, the, in the world now, knowledge is increasing. At such a rate, it's very, very difficult to catch up. And it has a lot of implications for almost everybody. Now, they, they've told us that between the beginning of the world and 1900, you have the accumulation of the basic knowledge of almost all things. Between 1900 and 1950, that, they, that knowledge doubled again. That means what it took the whole world, many, many generations to accumulate until 1900. By 50 years' time, they had multiplication by two. And then from 1950 to 1975, the knowledge doubled again. That means that if you put all the knowledge of the world from the beginning of the world until 1900 in a pile, and it took many, many, many years, thousands of years, the next 50 years, the next pile of knowledge was as high as the knowledge from the beginning of the world. In another 25 years, you have another pile equal to the pile of the 50 years. Now they tell us in this 21st century, every two, three years now, knowledge is doubling. And that means that if you're not, you not reading, if you're not studying, you become obsolete. And if you're in any industry, banking industry, medical, whatever, everything that you're doing, if you're not reading, running, and, and catching up with knowledge, you're going to be left behind. And because of that, and because people, they know that if they don't run with the age in which they are, they're not going to meet up. And you're not going to be able to make it in life. In fact, if you're just at the same knowledge as you were before, many other people, because of everything that is running ahead of you, you're not going to get promotion. You might even lose your job as things are going on. Because of that rat race, after knowledge, many people will not have time for spiritual things. In fact, in this age of internet, in this age of computer, there's a lot you want to know, a lot you want to see. And those things can make you to neglect your spiritual life because of the knowledge increasing. You better watch and be very careful and know that this Bible, you know, this one is not increasing, it's not decreasing. It's the constant word of God that remains and endures forever. And don't run after those things that will take you away from the Lord. Why you leave this one that is constant and it abides forever. We're told in Amos chapter 8, Amos chapter 8, and I'm reading from verse 11. Behold, it is calm, says the Lord God. That I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. That's the danger. As the knowledge is increasing on that other side, secular side, the spiritual side, many people will be neglecting the word of God. And therefore there will be a famine, and they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. And they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. What a dangerous time that will be. And that's why the Lord is telling us, if we're going to have this righteousness that qualifies us to meet the Lord when he comes, we must be thirsty, we must be hungry. We come to point number two, hunger and thirst. For the promised spiritual fullness. Hunger and thirst for the promised spiritual fullness. I come to Matthew chapter 5 verse 6 again. Matthew 5. I'm reading from verse 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. For they shall be filled. Have you noticed how Jesus Christ brought together two strong passions for the body? Hunger that's strong enough to even drive a person to seek for food at all costs. Thirst alone by itself is strong enough to make a person to a run after getting water so he can satisfy the thirst. When you bring both together, very hungry and very thirsty, that's telling us then that those passions of the soul, the desire of the soul, it comes together and puts great pressure upon us until we are filled. Blessed, happy are those who do hunger and thirst after righteousness so that they can be filled. I said, 
chapter 62, the passion we ought to have, the hunger that we ought to have, the desire that we ought to have, panting after God as it ought to be. Isaiah chapter 62, reading from verse 1. For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace. For Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamb that burneth. Here the prophet was saying it wasn't just satisfied with his own righteousness. That is, with the righteousness he got from the Lord. Then he said, for Jerusalem's sake, for Zion's sake, I will not rest. If I need to preach, I will preach. I need to pray, I will pray. I need to encourage, I will encourage. I will do everything to stir up the people of God so that they can have the righteousness that pleases the Lord. The righteousness that the Lord is looking for in every heart, in every life. For Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. That means I'll not be quiet. Are you a preacher? That's what you ought to do. You ought to be so thirsty and so hungry after righteousness that you will be filled and your local church will be filled. You are, sometimes you are surprised how a preacher, a pastor, a leader will be so happy when the church, the assembly, or the fellowship has not been filled with righteousness. You know, it is not something, it is not something uncommon to find a preacher saying, you know, praise the Lord. Our church is, you know, really growing. One will say, what do you mean by your church is growing? You know, you need to come to our Sunday worship and see the whole place is packed full. And we rejoice because of that. And then we, we want to ask him the question, your church, your denomination, your local assembly is full of people. But are they all full of righteousness? That's where the thing, that's where the important thing really is. Other people will say, hey, you know, the Lord is blessing our church. And now the finance of our church uh, this year, this period, is much, much, much greater than the finance of our church five years ago. We we'll say praise the Lord for that. That's wonderful. But as your church is being filled with people that have money, are they being filled with righteousness? You see, the thing that is important in the church of God, the most important, is the righteousness we ought to be filled with. And you know, sometimes when uh, preachers meet, how they compare notes, how they compare their churches. You know, they will talk about uh, the, uh, the money in their church. They'll talk about the choir of their church. They'll talk about, you know, the effectiveness of the workers in their church. They'll talk about this and talk about that. Those things are wonderful. Those things are good. But you know what the Lord is looking for? The Lord is looking for the members of the church to be filled with righteousness. If there's any passion, if there's any desire, if there's any enthusiasm, if there's any, any, any hunger and thirst in the heart of a preacher, in the heart of a prophet, in the heart of a man of God, is that that church, that assembly will be filled with righteousness. That's why the prophet said, for Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest. Then he says, until, until the righteousness thereof, the righteousness in that locality, the righteousness in that church, the righteousness in that assembly of the righteousness thereof, goes forth as brightness, and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. And then it says in verse 2, and the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness. You see, it is something that will be visible. Uh, it was like that in our church in the earlier years. And, you know, people send, uh, uh, they'll send announcements from places of work. And he'll say, we, have, we know these uh, people that go to deeper life, the righteousness, the principle, and the, uh, the, the integrity of the people. It impresses them so much. They send announcement here. And then they'll say, we want people from your church. 
I don't want anybody now to, you know, next uh, Monday, uh, because you see, uh, that's the hypocrisy of uh, people that are religious. When I preach something like this, and then they want to show that it is still like that, and then somebody will scribble something Sunday service next Sunday and say, we're looking for people in our place of work from deeper life because we know you are right. I'm not talking of something like that. You know, that's hypocrisy. When the pastor preaches something, instead of taking it to the Lord in prayer and saying, Lord, we want to have the good old days and have righteousness and holiness and sanctification in our midst, then when you hear preaching like that, somebody hypocritically will then write a note to us on Sunday uh, when they are making announcement. Then the fellow making announcement will say, uh, we praise the Lord, our church is still wonderful, our church is still good. Who are you deceiving? We're talking of something real. We didn't uh, do that in those olden days. The people themselves, they'll send letters to us. They'll send information to us. We need people from you that has in, have integrity and righteousness. Like the people who are walking here, send them to us. We want them to walk here. And we pray that the Lord will bring such days back into this church in Jesus' name. Amen. Give me a good, good Amen. amen. Then it tells us there in verse 3, it says, Thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. In verse 7, and give him no rest, give him no rest until he establish, until he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. And that's what the Lord is telling us. We need to be hungry and we need to be thirsty so that we can be filled. And if we're that thirsty, I believe the Lord will be faithful to his promise and he will do what he has said he will do in Jesus' name. In Psalm 62, Psalm 62, I'm reading from verse 1. Psalm 62. Reading from verse 1, truly my soul waiteth upon God. From him cometh my salvation. And as somebody who is thirsty, my soul waiteth upon God. Incidentally, this is some of David. And if anybody was busy at the time of David, David was busy, very busy. And yet he said he found time to wait upon the Lord. Verse 5, my soul wait, my soul, wait thou only upon God. For my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength. My refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, ye people. Trust in him at all times, ye people. Trust in the Lord at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Those are the people who are thirsty. Those are the people who are hungry for the things of the Lord. Do you remember when Saul got born again, when he got converted? He was so thirsty. He was so thirsty. For three days he was praying before the Lord. Acts of the Apostles chapter 9. Acts, I'm reading from chapter 9. Verse 8, Acts chapter 9, verse 8, and Saul rose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, neither did he eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, here am I, Lord. And he said, and the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. Three days and three nights, just praying, just praying. He wanted the fullness of God. All who sincerely desire and earnestly seek God will always find the Lord. Earnestness in seeking God, fervency in praying to him for the bestowal of the promised fullness will always be rewarded to find what we need. To find what we need, we need to seek. And to have the promised fullness will demand a resolve to pray without ceasing, waiting on the Lord. Until he actually, until it actually happens. That is, until that righteousness fills our heart, fills our soul, 
fills our mind, fills us with need through and through. The passion must be there all the time. That's why the prophet said, give him no rest until he established until he makes Jerusalem a place in the earth. Lack and limitation in our Christian lives should make us to seek the Lord without interruption, like Paul the Apostle did. Though he was, it, he was the last to be converted, I mean this Paul, he did more than the rest of the apostles all put together because of his waiting on the Lord at the commencement of his Christian faith with prayer and fasting. Likewise, if we want the fullness of God, we must wait on the Lord and pray with importunity. If we have not received, it's because we have not asked with passion, with desire, with hunger and thirst. The Lord tells us in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, reading from verse 7. Ask, and it shall be given unto you. And shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth. He that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. The Lord is telling us to ask and ask with importunity. Ask over and over until we're given what we're asking for. We come to point number three. The hungry and the thirsty, satisfied, filled, and fulfilled. The hungry and the thirsty, satisfied, filled, and fulfilled. Matthew chapter 5. Verse 6. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. For they shall be filled. Filled with what? I said filled with what? With righteousness. What is seeking for? Now, when that promise is fulfilled, how do we know that the person has been filled with righteousness? The Bible makes us to understand. Because you see, many times we may say we have something and yet we don't have that thing. It's like somebody saying, I have a power. And then when, they, when something confronts him that he needs to manifest that power, the power is not there. Other people saying, I have courage. And then when situations arise that will demand the manifestation of that courage, we cannot find that courage there. Other people say, I have integrity. And then when the situations arise that will actually show that the integrity is there, we don't find that integrity. So when it says, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst at righteousness, for they shall be filled. If we're filled with righteousness, what's the outcome? What's the evidence? I use the words I use, I've told you before, so you can remember. If I just read a lot of verses to you, and I don't structure them for you, you might not be able to remember, so that's why I do what I do. Therefore, I'm going to use the letters of the word righteous. And then when you look at the words of the letter, at the letters of the word righteous, you'll be able then to tell, you'll be able to remember in your, in your life whether you have been filled with that righteousness or not are the robe of righteousness. The robe of righteousness. We're told in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 61. In Isaiah chapter 61, I'm reading verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has closed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. I want you to look up here now for a moment. The robe of righteousness. Look at the children of Israel, how they dressed. And then when they were actually dressed, they were totally covered with the robe that they were wearing. And then the man said, look at the prophet saying, I praise the Lord. I glorify the Lord because he has given me the garment of salvation. Then he has covered me. When you have this righteousness we're talking about, you'll be covered like with a robe of righteousness. It will cover your whole body. It will cover your hands too. 
it will cover even your feet as well. That means it is that robe of righteousness that will dictate, that will control, that will direct everything that you do. And when people look at you, when you see how somebody is dressed, what do you see? The very first thing you see is the dress they are wearing. And you will see the nature of that dress, you'll see the color of that dress, and you'll see how that dress is covering them. And so, if somebody relates with you, the very first thing that will be visible, the very first thing that will be noticeable in your life will be that robe of righteousness. And you will see how clean it is, you'll see how it covers you. When we're filled with righteousness, the people want, that are living with us will not be wondering, I, hope, I, I wonder whether he is righteous or not. It's like somebody, I wonder whether he is dressed or not. You know he's dressed. You can see the dressing. I can see the dressing covers him. You'll not be wondering, does he have it, does he not have it? If people are wondering, if we ask your neighbor, if we ask your wife, if we ask your husband, uh, is your husband actually filled with righteousness? And your husband is saying, oh, well, go and ask her. She's of age. I cannot talk for her. Let her talk for herself. Something is missing. Is your uh, husband filled with righteousness? I cannot talk for him. Go and ask him. He's a, he's a man. He's of age. Let him talk for himself. Is your son, is your daughter filled with righteousness? Please, don't bother me. He's of age. Go and ask him. If they are talking like that, and they cannot put their neck on the line, and they cannot say, yes, I am sure. What, whoever you are asking for, for this one, I'm sure of this one. This one is covered with the robe of righteousness. That's it. When the Lord feels us. And then if, uh, you know, if anybody asks me and he said, uh, please, uh, so and so is a member of your church. And we want you to please write a letter of recommendation on his behalf. Because we want to put him in a very delicate place, in an important place. And we don't want anybody that will take all our money away. Please, uh, if you were right concerning him, we're, we're sure that he'll, be, he'll do right. He'll do well. If I get such a letter concerning you, can I vouch for your integrity? Can I put my neck on the line for your righteousness? Can I say, yes, you can take him because I know that individual. Or would we say, oh, uh, interview him yourself. And if you take him, that's, that, that's your own decision. And if you don't take him, that's your decision. This is church. We don't commit ourselves about anybody, about anything. We have many members in our church, and we don't want to, you know, start writing letter, letter every time. When we avoid writing letters of recommendation for you like that, maybe we're not sure about your life. But you see, when somebody is covered with the robe of righteousness, we can tell, I the instruments of righteousness. Instruments of righteousness. We're looking at Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 13. Romans chapter 6, verse 13. Instruments of righteousness. It tells us in Romans chapter 6, verse 13. It says, neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Instruments of righteousness unto God. I'm sure you are familiar with the word instrument. Look at a mechanic. He wants to repair uh, maybe a car or a machine or whatever it is. And he takes his tools, his instruments, and he uses the instrument to repair that thing. And you become an instrument in the hands of God when you are filled with righteousness. Anywhere there is unrighteousness, he uses you. He uses your mouth. He uses your eyes. He uses your attitude. He uses your hand. He uses your lifestyle. He uses your interaction with the people as instrument to bring righteousness into their lives. And the question I'm asking you is this. Your presence in society, your presence in the church, your interaction with the people in the church, are you like an instrument of righteousness? Or the people who get close to you, are you instrument of unrighteousness? And then you are making them to become unrighteous. You are making them to become a uh, kind of careless. You are making them to be, uh, to be hypocritical. You are making them to be deceitful. You are making them to be insincere. You see, when we're filled with righteousness, R, you'll have the robe of righteousness. I, you'll be an instrument of righteousness. You know, sometimes we're trying to correct our, our children in the youth section. 
and will say, why are you doing like this? Why are you doing like this? Ah, uh, they say, go and correct mommy first. Go and correct daddy first. You see, if daddy and mommy, if they are full of righteousness, that at home, our children never hear us gossip. Our children, they never see us get angry between daddy and mommy. Our children, they never see us fight in the bedroom. Our children, they never see us do anything that will say, you children, come here. It's not everything your eyes see, your ears hear, that you observe in the family. You'll be going and be talking to your youth leader. This is our family. You're here. If we have to be warning our children like that, whatever happens here, go on, don't go and tell them outside. Why are we warning them? If they see righteousness, why shouldn't they take the righteousness outside and go and blast and go and proclaim and go and broadcast that righteousness? You see, we must be instruments of righteousness on our children. If a maid is living with you, and maybe an apprentice living with you at home, and then you are not an instrument of righteousness, you are not filled with righteousness. That the fellow is saying, once I leave this uh, master's house, once I leave this uh, lady woman's house, I'll never, I'll never go to deeper life. I'll, nev I'll never step inside that deeper life. Then you are not an instrument of righteousness. If you're an instrument of righteousness, your life will influence other people to, to become righteous. And I'm reading to you from the Bible. G, the gift of righteousness. The gift of righteousness. Romans chapter 5. In Romans chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 17. Romans chapter 5, verse 17. For ye by one man's offense, death range by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness, of the gift of righteousness, shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. The gift of righteousness. Now, you understand? If you're giving somebody a gift, you give him a real gift, a good gift. When, when, all, when the Almighty God is giving us a gift, he doesn't give out the gift like a selfish person. He gives us the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. When you have a gift, the people will know this fellow has a gift. You know, sometimes you'll find somebody that has, you know, a gift of communication. And you can tell he has a gift of communication. Sometimes you find a person that has a gift of a mending a relationship. That is, uh, this fellow and this fellow, uh, they are at loggerheads. They are, they are not, uh, they are not uh, able to see eye to eye. They say, go and call Brasso and so. Because that Brasso and so, we all know him. He has a gift of mending relationship, of reconciling people together. And true enough, when Brasso and so comes and, you know, this one will talk and this one will talk and they're almost angry at one another. And then when this Brasso and so begins to talk, then they say, why are we even quarreling? Then they begin to smile, then they shake hands, and then they are reconciled because that brother has the gift of reconciliation. The same thing, when you have the gift of righteousness, it will be something visible. We will know that the Lord has given you the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, and you reign. You reign in life. You reign over sin. You reign over temptation. You reign over trial. You are, it's like you are walking on the water. And the gift of righteousness be very visible, noticeable in our lives. In fact, H, you become the habitation of righteousness. Habitation of righteousness. When you are filled with righteousness, that righteousness lives inside your heart, inside your soul, inside your spirit. Job chapter 8 verse 6. Job chapter 8 I'm reading to you from verse 6. It tells us, If thou wert pure and upright, surely now he would awake for thee and make the habitation of thy righteousness prosperous. Habitation of righteousness. It means that righteousness will be living inside your heart. Or it will dwell inside your heart. And it is not just visiting your heart. It is not coming and going. You know, there are people, when they wake up in the morning, it's like, you know, they went through a battle, a fight, a conflict in the night in their dream. And they're angry at everybody. That's not habitation of righteousness. When you have habitation of righteousness, righteousness is living there. 
When there's no food, righteousness is living there. When there's no money, righteousness is living there. When there is food, righteousness is living there. And you never forget yourself. When you have the things of this world, it then righteousness will not take vacation. And righteousness is no more there. When we're filled with righteousness, we become the habitation of righteousness. That the righteousness is there all the time. That the righteousness is living there, is abiding there, is dwelling there. And, you know, your relatives, your children can come home anytime. They'll find the righteousness there. And when your relatives are not around, when your wife is not there, when your husband is not there, righteousness does not take a flight and then go away. The righteousness is abiding there permanently. That's being filled with righteousness, blessed at they which do hunger and thirst at a righteousness for they shall be filled and then she you become the tree of righteousness bearing the fruit of righteousness is the tree that bears the fruit and the lord actually says it will so do it you'll so work it out in your life that you become the tree of righteousness isaiah chapter 61 isaiah chapter 61 I'm reading from verse 3. In Isaiah chapter 61 verse 3. To open, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion. To give unto them beauty for ashes. Or the oil of joy for mourning. And the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. That they might be called the trees of righteousness. The planting of the Lord. That he might be glorified. The trees of righteousness. You see in our lives. When that righteousness really comes there. And dwells there. And abides there. And reigns in our hearts and our lives. Then we actually literally become. The trees of righteousness. We will be producing the fruit. In its season. And every time there will be no dry season and rainy season, good season, bad season. We are planted by the Lord in the kingdom of God. And the tree is always bearing that fruit. Always bearing that fruit. That's why the Lord is saying it will be very evident when we really have this righteousness filling us. This righteousness saturating us. This righteousness satisfying us. This righteousness satiating us from within that will become the very trees of righteousness bearing the fruit of righteousness then we, the e there is enduring righteousness enduring righteousness everlasting righteousness endless righteousness is there is just increasing and it's progressing and it's expanding and then it's flowing out from us unto other people enduring Endless, everlasting righteousness. In Psalm 112, Psalm 112, I'm reading there from verse 3. Psalm 112, verse 3. Wealth and riches shall be in his house, and his righteousness endureth forever. You see, when we're filled with righteousness, it's not something that dries up after one week. After one month. But it says his righteousness endureth forever. Unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. And he is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. A good man showeth favor. And lendeth he will guide his affairs with discretion. The right, he sh surely he shall not be moved forever. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He shall not be afraid until he sees desires upon his enemies. He, he has dispersed. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endureth forever. His horn shall be exalted with honor. You see what the Lord is telling us? That righteousness continues and it endures ever. Psalm 106, 106. I'm reading to you from verse 3. Blessed are they which keep judgment and he that doeth righteousness at all times. He doeth righteousness at all times. He doeth righteousness at all times. 
That means then, when this righteousness we're talking about, when it fills us, we'll be doing righteousness at all times. You know the people that fluctuate so much, you cannot predict them. Their righteousness varies with their mood. Their righteousness varies with the weather. Their righteousness varies with the bad attitudes of the people around them. If the people around them, if they, if they misbehave or they are bad or they do something that offends them, no righteousness. Then when the people around them, when they come around and, you know, they are nice, they are friendly, then again they cheer up and it appears the righteousness that was dead rises again from the dead. But you see, when we actually have this righteousness we are talking about, it does not fluctuate. And you do not allow the mood of other people, the action of the action of other people and the desires of other people and whatever it is that the other people are doing, you don't allow that to affect your righteousness. The righteousness remains there. The righteousness abides there and it abides forever. It's not that when you're feeling hot, when you're feeling unhappy, when you're feeling sad, when you're feeling disappointed, then the righteousness goes down. And then when you feel all of a sudden excited and enthusiastic and everything is all right, then you wake up, let's be righteous again. Not at all. It's a constant thing. It's an enduring thing. It's an unending thing. It's an everlasting thing. In fact, we're told in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel chapter 9, the kind of righteousness that the Lord said he was going to bring in. Daniel chapter 9, I'm reading to you there. Uh, from verse 24. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. In Daniel 9, verse 24, 17 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make, and to make, it says in that verse 24, and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in what kind of righteousness tell me out loud everlasting righteousness that means it's not a fluctuating righteousness it's down now and then it's up later and it's changing with the mood and it's changing with the actions of the people and it's changing with you know whether the people love you or whether they don't love you whether they persecute you or they give you pleasure whether they are friendly or they hate you no it's an everlasting righteousness unending righteousness endless righteousness and then enduring righteousness that's the kind of righteousness that jesus christ was to bring to the people and it says he'll make an end of sin it make reconciliation for the sinners and then he'll bring in everlasting righteousness or obedience unto righteousness you see when we're righteous there will be obedience obedience unto righteousness I want you to look at Romans chapter 6 and we're looking at verse 16 Romans chapter 6 verse 16 in Romans chapter 6 verse 16 here is what it says know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, is servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, of obedience unto righteousness. A person cannot say, yes, I'm righteous, but there's no obedience. If there is righteousness, there will be obedience. And it says there is obedience unto righteousness. You see, this is why the Lord is saying, we should be filled with righteousness. Blessed are they which do thirst and hunger after righteousness, for they shall be filled. When that in filling with righteousness is there, there will be obedience in our lives. Again, this is constant obedience. Constant obedience. Constant obedience. And, um, you know, sometimes here we are in church. And you'll find that maybe 10 years ago, if you directed a particular member and said, go and do this, you know, they just obey. They say, well, that's the word of God. And the pastor must have a reason for telling us to do that because he has, he, he knows the word of God. And he is there to lead us in the way of the Lord. And he's not going to tell us to do anything if, it's, if he doesn't find it in the word of God. That's the way you thought 10 years ago. But now after so many years, as they say, familiarity brings contempt. Now we say, do it this way, do it this way. 
his obedience as it was 10 years ago. You see, when there's righteousness, there'll be no variation in that obedience. There'll be no fluctuation in that obedience. There'll be obedience unto righteousness when it is really there. When our interest is to get to heaven, and we know to get to heaven, there must be holiness, and there cannot be holiness without obedience. And there cannot be righteousness either without disobedience unto righteousness. You there is understanding, the understanding of righteousness understanding of righteousness in proverbs chapter 2 proverbs chapter 2 we're looking at verse 9 proverbs chapter 2 we're looking at verse 9 proverbs chapter 2 verse 9 then shalt thou understand righteousness when God fills you with that righteousness, there will be understanding. You'll say, yes, now I understand. Now I understand. The height, the depth, the breadth, the length of the kind of righteousness the Lord is asking for. There will be understanding in righteousness, in your action, in your lifestyle, in your relationship, in your interaction. You'll have understanding of righteousness and you're not going to do anything that contradicts that spirit giving understanding of righteousness. And then S, you become the servant of righteousness. As you become the servant of righteousness. We're looking at Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. I'm reading to you from verse 18. Romans chapter 6. Reading from verse chapter 6 verse 18. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Free from sin. Private sin, common sin, besetting sin, occasional sin, whatever sin it is, the sin of society that everybody practices, the one that has been now approved by other people, sanctioned by other people, recommended by other people, say, no, now I'm free from sin. The blood of Jesus washes and cleanses us from all sin. And then, and then you become servants of righteousness. You see, when Jesus said that blessed, happy, fortunate are those that do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled. It means then there's going to be the robe of righteousness. There's going to be the instrument of righteousness. There will be the gift of righteousness. The habitation of righteousness. The trees of righteousness. Then there will be endless, enduring, everlasting righteousness. Obedience unto righteousness. Understanding of righteousness. And then you become the servants of righteousness. Let's look at Amos. In Amos chapter 5. I'm reading to you from... Verse 24. Amos chapter 5, verse 24. But let judgment run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. It becomes a stream of righteousness in your life. It's not just a drop of water, it's not just a cup, but it's a whole stream. It becomes a stream of righteousness in your life. Hosea chapter 10. In Hosea chapter 10, verse 12, sow to yourself in righteousness. Reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord until he come and rain righteousness upon you. To rain righteousness upon us, a flood, a stream. Of righteousness. And then he tells us in Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4. I'm reading to you from verse 2. But unto you that fear my name. Shall the son of righteousness arise. With healing in his wings. And he shall go forth and grow up. As calves of the stall, the sun of righteousness shining upon your life and shining without going down. That's what the Lord says, that the sun will rise 
and then it will no, not grow dim anymore. The Lord has taught us today and is a faithful God. He never fails in fulfilling his promises. Therefore, as we come to the Lord and he says he wants to fill us, he wants to saturate us, he wants to satisfy us with his righteousness. He says, ask, it will be given you. Seek and you'll find. Knock, it shall be opened unto you. Everyone that asketh receiveth. He that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. The Lord will do it tonight. I said the Lord would do it tonight. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. And say, Lord, this is what I want. Lord, this is my desire. Lord, this is my passion. Lord, this is what I'm seeking after. The righteousness of the Lord. The hunger and the thirst that leads to that in feeling with righteousness. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. righteousness and remember except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees ye shall in no wise center into the kingdom of God except your righteousness shall exceed shall go beyond the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. It shall in no wise center into the kingdom of God. It's not an assumed righteousness. Something you are trying to convince yourself you have. Which the Lord does not recognize. Righteousness without hypocrisy. Righteousness without insincerity. Righteousness without pretense. Righteousness. If you are not clothed with the robe of righteousness, you will appear naked before the great judge of heaven. Pray before the Lord. Let him close you. With that robe of righteousness. Without it, we miss heaven. And we need to hunger and thirst. Church activity cannot be a substitute for righteousness. Being a worker in the church cannot be, will not be a substitute for righteousness. Being a preacher, being a singer, being a worker cannot be, will not be a substitute for righteousness. Righteousness in the heart. Righteousness in attitude. Righteousness in the family. That your wife can bear witness. Your wife can bear witness. You are full of righteousness. You are full of love. You are full of tenderness. Your husband can be a witness. You are clothed with the robe of righteousness. You are not full of wrath. You are full of righteousness. You are not full of anger and indignation. You are full of righteousness. You are not full of hypocrisy. You are full of sincerity. You are not full of bribes. 
You are full of faith. Whatever I get, the Lord will give it to me. You don't have to bribe. If you are full of bribes, you're still of the world. You're still a sinner. Repent and come to the Lord. And let the blood of Jesus wash you, cleanse you, purge you, purify you, and give you the righteousness that the Lord is looking for that will help you to be able to see his face on that final day. Be an instrument of righteousness to members of your family. An instrument of righteousness to members in the church. Those who are close to you, those who interact with you. Be an influence of righteousness to the people who are close to you. That their interaction with you will make them more righteous in the Lord. And they'll have that righteousness that heavens will testify about. That this is of God. An instrument of righteousness to your wife. An instrument of righteousness to your children. An instrument of righteousness to your co-workers. You have a good influence on other people. Leading them. Directing them. Making them thirsty and hungry. For righteousness. Make sure you possess the gift of righteousness. The abundance of grace. And the gift of righteousness. And be the habitation of righteousness. Be the habitation of righteousness. That righteousness resides in your heart. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. If righteousness is in the heart, it will show in the language. It will show your tongue. It will show in your speech. It will show in your attitude. Pray that the Lord will make you a tree of righteousness. And you'll bear the fruit. You'll bear the fruit of righteousness. Trees of righteousness. Bearing the fruit of righteousness. Fruit. The fruit, the fruit of righteousness. Every time, all the time, every day, all the days of your life, the fruit of righteousness. Pray that the Lord will grant you enduring righteousness, endless righteousness, everlasting righteousness. You won't be stagnant. That righteousness will not dry up. In the dry season of life, be endless, enduring, everlasting. Obedience unto righteousness. You'll obey the Spirit of the Lord promptly. 
your life will be characterized by obedience 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 unto righteousness and the obedience of today will not be less than the obedience of 10 years ago if anything it will be higher it will be greater more spontaneous than the obedience of 10 years ago and there will be the understanding of righteousness that will be the central major important understanding of your life understanding righteousness become the servants of righteousness to serve in righteousness and the streams will flow the streams of righteousness then the sun of righteousness will shine in your heart and through your life blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled.